Well, good morning, everybody. I want to say a big hello to everybody watching us on Facebook this morning. Those of you out on the patio, all the moms in the mom's room, wherever you're watching us on YouTube throughout the week, we're glad you're here with us this morning. And we have a gift for you. It's a series on wisdom, and we invited the wisest woman we know. Uh, <laughs> give it up for Amy. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> good morning, everyone. How is everyone? Good? Slept well? People are, are perky this morning. I like it. I like it a lot. For those of you I don't know, my name is Amy Elliott. I am a therapist. I'm part of the sermon writing team. And it is great to be here talking about wisdom. Uh, moving Toward Wisdom is just a series of decisions, right? a series of choices. Research shows that we make roughly 35,000 remotely conscious decisions a day. Those are the ones we know about, remotely conscious. Think about all the ones you make that you don't even think about, right? It's just choices, decisions all the time. And sometimes I need to make choice, and sometimes I don't have to make a choice, right? There are some things, if I go to the ice cream store, I love ice cream, you should know this, I will always get a scoop of chocolate ice cream. I have tasted chocolate ice cream from the East Coast to the West Coast, right? I will go in and get my scoop of chocolate ice cream, but sometimes I really like mint chip too, and so I don't have to choose. <laughs> I'll get one of both, right? That's not a choice I need to make. Do I have other chocolate lovers? You go to Dairy Queen, it's a chocolate base, not a vanilla, don't waste your time, chocolate base, right? Yeah, that is the only way to go. You don't have to make the choice, though. Uh, my kids try to make me make the choice between them. They want me to choose who my favorite child is. And so, like, my daughter signs cards, love your favorite child. And my son has changed his contact information in my husband's phone to favorite child. So that's what comes up each time. And they'll say things like, don't say anything if I'm your favorite child. Blink if I'm your favorite child, right? But I have one of each, so I get the, the privilege of saying, you are my favorite boy and you are my favorite girl. I don't have to choose. Now, there are other things that I have to choose. I have to make a decision. My daughter is playing in a soccer game right now, and I would love to be there. But I love being here. But I can't be in two places at once. I cannot. That is a choice that I had to make. So I'm here with you guys this morning. It was a good choice for me. <laughs> I, you all know I've preached on music before. I love music. I cannot listen to music while I read. I can't do it. I, right? Like the words, I hear the words and I'm thinking about the words and I can't. So for me, that's a choice. I can either read or listen to music. Everyone else in my family can do both. I don't have that gene, right? Now that's true, this whole choice thing, for superficial light things, ice cream, music. But it's true for big stuff too. Sometimes we have to make a choice. We have to make a decision. I can't be in a healthy relationship and have an active addiction that takes my thoughts, my time, my energy, my desire. I look forward to it. I do things to organize my life around it. I can't have an active addiction and be in a healthy relationship. And if you are the person in relationship with someone in an active addiction, it's not going to be a healthy relationship. A choice is being made. I cannot steal from work and live according to my values. I can't do both. I have to make a decision. Now the problem comes when it comes to those deeper things and we think we don't have to choose. Where we think, I, I can do it both. I They're just office supplies. I'll take the supplies and you know, it'll be fine. And we justify and we end up kind of scooching along thinking we don't have to go right or left. And what happens is we end up drifting from where we want to be. We end up drifting away from God. And so that's what we're talking about today. How do we keep ourselves from drifting away from God in the decisions that matter? In this entire sermon series, we've been talking about Solomon, so why stop now? We're going to be in 1 Kings 10. Now you'll remember uh, Solomon, so David is king. He is the warrior king. He wants to build God a temple. God says, no, no, that's not your job. So his son Solomon comes after him, and Solomon's the one that's going to build the temple for the Lord. 
And Solomon is praying to God, and God says, what do you want? And Solomon says, wisdom, right? Solomon says, wisdom. And God says, because you asked for wisdom, when you could have asked for anything else, I'm going to give you all the other stuff too. I'm going to give you riches and wealth and power and prestige. I'm going to give you all those things because you ask for wisdom. So Solomon's rolling pretty well right now. And that's where we find him uh, in 1023. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings on the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. What do you buy for the man who has everything? Articles of silver, gold, robes, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. You must not intermarry with them, not because they're from a different place, not because they might have a different color skin, not because they might look different than you, not because I created them any less than, not because they're not my valuable children. No, you must not intermarry them because they serve a different God. And as a result of getting in relationship with them, you're going to drift away from me. Your heart's going to be turned toward their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. We've got to stop for a quick sec. So in the New Testament, Paul tells us, right, so uh, Jesus has died and risen, and they are waiting for Jesus to come back. And they believe in Paul's time that the second coming was imminent, was going to happen any time. So they were in preparation mode. And so he tells the people, hey, don't marry if you can help it. Because how many married people in here? How many people with kids? Okay. You know it's hard, right? It takes a lot of time and energy and effort. And you've got a million things going in your head all the time. So Paul is saying, hey, marriage takes away from a single focus on God. So if you can, don't get married. But if you can't, marry. There's nothing wrong. That, that's fine. Serve the Lord together. He just knows that when we have competing things going on, there's less attention for God. So Paul is talking about one spouse. Let's return to Solomon. Did you hear the numbers I said? Right? Logistically, I don't even know how that works, but like that is, Paul's telling us one is hard, and he goes forward with 700 and 300 concubines. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. You'll remember the story of David. David was a train wreck. David falls in love with the neighbor, right, gets her pregnant. Oh, she's married, so he goes and has the husband killed on the front lines. David makes his mistakes, and yet he just says the Lord completely as his father David had done. What that means for us is that no matter what you have done, as long as you return your heart to the Lord, you are a man or a woman after God's own heart. David made his mistakes, and they were big ones. And we have all made our mistakes, and they are big ones. But as long as we continually turn our hearts back to him, he can use us. Right? David's a great example for all of us. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord so said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, right, very parental, since this is your attitude, and you've not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you 
and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, that guy who messed up so many times but kept coming back and loving me, I will not do it during your lifetime. I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I'll give him one tribe, again, for the sake of David, my servant, for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Solomon fails to understand a basic truth. He fails to recognize that there is a battle going on for his heart. He thinks that life is just what it looks like instead of understanding that there is a much bigger spiritual battle for ownership of his heart. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. Now, does that mean we can't have other loves? No. What it means is God's right here, right? He's our priority. He's first. And he's got this umbrella. And under that is our existence. And it's all the things that make us us. It's our desires. It's that passion that burns in you. It's the relationships you have. It's your giftings. It's your uniqueness. All of that is in this wonderful space. And God is saying, don't elevate any of this to be equal to me. All of this is in my will. When you ask yourself, I don't know if that's in God's will, the question we need to ask every day is, is it something that pushes me toward God or pulls me away from him? So if you're trying to make a decision and you're thinking, I, I just don't know, if it brings you fullness of life and joy and it draws you closer to God, go for it. If it is going to get in the way of your relationship with God or draw you from him, that's a no. Because outside of this umbrella that we have are all these things that compete for our affection and our attention. Right? Those are the ladies. Those are the foreign gods for Solomon. And it gets taken out of the will of God. So God is saying, hey, all these other interests you have, they are great. Just don't elevate them above where they should be. Don't make them idols. So we need to know what falls on that outer ring? What are the gods we are tempted to follow? Where are we tempted to be like Solomon? He followed Ashtoreth. Now, Ashtoreth is the goddess of nature, fertility. Has anyone ever seen a fertility god? I remember being in Europe a while ago, and it was, okay, it was 94 or 95, and um, my sister was trying to get pregnant, and there was this fertility god there, and, you know, all these women are standing in line to rub the little dude's head. And she did. It didn't work. Eventually it worked. No credit to the fertility god. But that there was a thing. Everyone, even in our day and age, was very drawn to this fertility god. And then Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, he is associated with child sacrifice. So he was this big statue with arms like this where there's a consuming fire underneath. And people would come and put their children right here and sacrifice their children to him. Not, not my favorite. Uh, and then Chemosh was sort of a destroyer, subduer, fish god, right? Now you're going through this list thinking, I promise you, I am not in danger of uh, worshiping a fish god anytime soon, right? Child sacrifice, not on my list of to-dos. But don't we have our own? Don't we have the, our own little things that fall outside and vie for our attention? We put some options up here. Some things that might become idols or gods to us, our career. I spend all my time wanting to get forward, wanting to move ahead, and so I kind of ignore my family or other things that need to happen, and I'm willing to take some shortcuts if it means I move forward and I get that power. And people look at me and they know. They know I've arrived. Or my significant other and my children it's when we become so enmeshed in relationships, we kind of fail to understand where we end and they begin. I'm not okay if you're not okay, and when you're okay, I can be okay. That's when we've elevated them to God-like status. And you think, oh, I didn't elevate my kids, but everything is about your kids and how they're doing it. Are you okay? Or your spouse. Money, status, appearance, pleasure. Really? The old Freudian, we're motivated by pleasure and pain. We avoid pain and seek pleasure. How true is that for you? And then followers on social media. There's a whole crop, a whole generation of people coming up that can tell you 
how many followers individuals have. And it's like a, a symbol of value. You're valuable because you have followers. That person is worthwhile because they have that many followers. And so it becomes a way to measure one's worthiness. It's kind of sad, right? Some of us in the room might notice how many people like things on Facebook for the older generation who still uses Facebook. Uh, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting. That's me, by the way. I lurk, though. I lurk. Uh, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil. God does not tempt us. It's those things that we want that stand outside that umbrella that drag us away, and that's hunting language, drag us away. Can't you just see it like getting it at us in their grip, dragging us away because we are enticed by our own evil desire, and so we get dragged away. And so we have to understand that there are choices that need to be made. Sometimes it just has to be the way it has to be. We wrote it this way, I have to make either or, not both and decisions. Now, you know, you've heard me preach, I am all about both and. That is the way I operate in the world because the world is messy and we are broken and we are fallen and it's just more confusing than a straight line. And so we as believers are called to recognize truths like God is good and really bad things happen to good people. We have to hold at the same time that God is in control and can do all things, and he allows tragedy and things we wish didn't happen. We have to hold those at the same time as believers. That's the both and. And I don't know about you, but that's hard for me sometimes. When I see horrific things happen, that is hard for me, and yet I cling to the truth that both are true. So the world is both and, except when it comes to the authority of God. That is absolutely when we move to either or. When it comes to something that is vying for your affection and attention and trying to get equal platform with God, that is an either or. We can't have it both ways. No one can serve two masters, says Jesus. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and fill in the blank. You cannot serve both God and career equally. You cannot serve both God and family equally. You cannot serve both God and money equally. God needs to be the God of your life. And so we need to take steps to proactively guard our hearts against this. To know what our vulnerabilities are so that we don't tumble into them. And we really are on guard for the battle that's happening. It's funny because this, has everyone heard that term, guard your heart? It's sort of a Christian-y thing to say, guard your heart. And it's sort of gendered, right? So men learn guard your heart, usually in a sexual purity sense. They're told guard your heart. Nothing's wrong with the first look. It's the second look that matters, right? You look, you bounce your eyes. If you've read uh, Every Man's Battle, you know this. It's great advice. And so men are told, Guard your heart. Guard what comes in, what you look at. Women, on the other hand, are taught, oh, guard your heart. Like, that guy, don't give too much of yourself to him. You don't know what he's about. You don't know what his intentions are about. Guard your heart. And so we're taught relationally, guard your heart. Both are probably true for both genders. <laughs> we need to be on the lookout all the time. But there are other places, too. You're going to get hurt. If you're in relationship with other people, you're going to get hurt. And so we have to guard our hearts against bitterness and resentment that can just infiltrate and then take roots and then change us, right? And sometimes, oh, resentment feels so good because he so deserves it. But we have to guard our hearts so it doesn't change us. Or feelings, you're going to have the feelings. You can't stop the feelings that you're going to have. It doesn't matter the feelings. It matters what you do with them. And so when the feelings of envy and jealousy come in, you need to guard your heart so that they don't stay planted. Anger is a wonderful emotion. Don't let anybody tell you differently. The problem is when we don't deal with our anger and it transfers over to rage. Right? Then it starts to change us. We need to focus on what's happening to us. Our bodies will always tell us how we're feeling, 
We need to pay attention so that we can process those emotions, feel them, work through them, so that they don't dig into our hearts in a different way and change us from within. We've used this verse several times. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. When you are feeling bitter, the way that you act, the words that come out of your mouth will reflect that. When you are feeling angry, your actions and words will reflect that. Right? The Bible tells us out of the overflow of the heart speaks the mouth. We know what's in there. And so we have to be aware of what our vulnerabilities are so we can protect ourselves from things that might lead us astray. We have to know what lies on the outside and vies for our attention. The Lord told the Israelites, you must not intermarry them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Solomon loved the ladies. That's his problem, right? The ladies were the ones calling to him from the outside. What are the things calling to you from the outside where God's saying, don't go there, right? Don't intermarry them. Don't go there. You cannot handle it. This is too much for you. Don't do that. It's not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to keep your life in balance if you say that or do that or go there or engage in that relationship. It's too much. Trust me. I know your limits. I know your struggles. And so we take those struggles and we transform them into prayers. My clicker's off. There we go. We take our struggles and we transform them into prayers. I want to go back to that one right before there, though. We need to know where we tend to be most vulnerable. This is a question we put up there, not for you to answer in here today. This is a question for you to star, circle, write down, take a mental picture of, take a real picture of. I want you to think about it this week. What are your vulnerabilities? What are the things that lie outside of that space that call to you? Solomon's ladies, what are yours? And then, like I said, we transform our struggles into prayers. God wants to hear from you. He has no desire for you to do this life by yourself. Zero desire. Oh, and by the way, you can't anyway. So maybe we stop trying. Maybe we start bringing those struggles to God. Uh, don't be anxious, says Paul, about anything. Don't spin. Don't perseverate. Don't catastrophize. Don't come back to. Don't sit on. Don't twirl around in your head. Don't become obsessive about. Don't become preoccupied with anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, it's always important to remember our blessings, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, there it is again, Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That struggle that you are having, that continual thing you keep going back to, Christ is saying, exchange that for peace. Bring it to him. Exchange that for peace. That's what he's offering. How do I do that? We start by filling our minds with what God values. We have to know what God values to exchange it out for what we're thinking about. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I have confessed this before. I'll confess it again. I cannot for the life of me memorize this scripture. Like, I just can't. The words, and so I've given myself permission that as long as I know the main words, like noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, I'm good to go. Because I, I don't know why. I cannot do this one. It just doesn't stick but I get the spirit of the law over the letter here. I know what God's telling me to exchange it with. So how do we get the truth in us? How do we memorize scripture? Some people, we used to, around our old house, we had little um, scripture verses written and like put on walls. So right next to the sink where my children would hopefully do dishes, it says, do everything as if, on work, as if working unto the Lord, right? A little inspiration. Uh, in the bathroom mirror, take refuge in me, kind of getting ready for the day. And that's how I memorize them. My husband writes them on uh, those little, what are those called, index cards? Writes them on index cards. I know Pastor Mike and Teresa do the same. Pastor Lisa used to put them, when her kids were babies, uh, on the stroller. And she'd go for a walk, and she would memorize it as she walked. Which, by the way, the whole crossing of the brain midline as you move your legs helps you remember things. 
just a fun tip for free there. Uh, so that is a good way to memorize scripture. I also, and you all know this, I love Psalms. I cannot tell you how many Bible verses I know that are set to Psalms, right? Don't build your house on a sandy land just popped in half of your heads right now, didn't it? Anyone want to remember Salty the songbook? Salty. Salty the songbook. But I know a million songs, Children Obey Your Parents and the Lord. That's one of my favorites. I like to sing that around my house, right? I like these songs. That's how they stay in me, is that I know the words and they're set to song, and then I can recall them when I need them. Some of the ones that the band sang this morning, just even if you know a line or two, because most of the songs that we sing are verses. They come from the Bible. Do you remember Ron DePew was a wonderful worship leader here with us? He was great at setting scripture to music. Memorize scripture that way. What, however your brain works, do it so you get it in you. And then make sure you're daily checking in with yourself to keep your heart healthy. Uh, we know that Solomon started in a really good place. And then as he grew older, as time passed and life happened, he made choices and decisions that did not benefit his relationship with the Lord. He did that slow fade, right? He didn't check in with himself. The Lord became angry because his heart had turned away from the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. The reason that daily heart checks are so important is because sometimes when we realize things are a problem, it's way out of our control, right? I told you before I'm a therapist, which means that I have the honor of walking alongside people in their darkest times. I get to walk with them through the tunnel until we see the light at the end. What that means is I hear stories every single day, really hard stories, really complex stories, and I help people sift through those. But stories I hear a lot are stories about affairs. And I will tell you, no one wakes up in the morning one day out of nowhere and says, today I'm going to have an affair. It does not happen that way. See, what happens is something like this. They're hanging out at work, male, female, and they're talking and, you know, things aren't going so well at home, and so they start talking about how things aren't going so well at home. And because it's a completely artificial environment, there's no laundry, there's no responsibility, there's no kids with needs, everyone gets to be perfect. Oh, he understands me like no one has ever understood me. She really sees me, right? And it becomes this relationship. And soon the texts increase, and then there's more emails and more thoughts about the person, and the lunches linger. And then before you know it, there's an emotional affair in place, and the door is open. And then usually the physical affair follows. See, no one wakes up saying, I'm going to have an affair. But all these things happened every day along the way, and no heart check stopped it. And so we have to be checking in. We have to be honest with ourselves. We are all like just a few decisions away from doing things we never thought possible. Never forget that. Never think that any of us are beyond the scope of making some bad decisions that would really impact our lives. Right? If pornography is your issue and you don't have security on your devices, you're fooling yourself. If you don't have like an R tribe or some other thing on your phone that connects you to other men or other women to hold you accountable, you're fooling yourself. It's a slow fade. If you think you can hang out with people who gossip and not join them, it might be good the first couple times, right? But then gossip feels good because you're part of something. And you're not the one being gossiped about because you're in the circle at that moment, right? And so you join in and you bond and it's fun. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that is not who I am. That is not who I wanted to be. It just kind of happened. Oh, church is the same way, too. I've never met anyone who wakes up and is like, I'm done with church. Well, actually, I have met people who do that. But <laughs> generally, what happens is you skip church the first time. 
and you feel guilty about it. But you know what? That second Sunday, it's a lot easier. And then, oh, we, have, we are just so busy right now. And the third Sunday is even easier. Or I didn't join a life group this season, and so I don't really know anyone, so I go to church and people don't know me, so no one's going to know if I'm not there. And then before we know it, we've lost relationship with community, with the body of believers. Slowly. And so we daily need to check in to make sure that we're taking care of our hearts. David says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. By the way, I know three different versions of this song. All that, do you know three versions too? Like, this is a go-to that people in the 80s wanted to make a song about. So, but it's a really good verse. Create in me a pure heart because I don't have one, God. Renew, that means I've lost it. Renew that steadfast spirit. The, the desire to not reach outside of your will. The desire to not be dragged away by the things that entice me. Make me strong, God. And then we regularly need to tell him how weak we are. We regularly need to come clean. See, this promise is so important. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us. No matter what you have done, no matter what you are in the middle of doing, if you confess to God, he will forgive you. Now, some of you are thinking, I know, but I keep doing it. Like, I, I did it, and I felt so bad. I felt so much shame, and so I confessed. But then I did it again, and that shame spiral, just like the wave came over me. And then I did it again, and like, why would God want to hear from me? Because I keep going back to that thing. And God's like, I knew you would. It's okay. Stop trying on your own strength. Exchange that thing for my peace. Even if you don't do it right the first 3,000 times, that steadfast spirit, keep trying, keep bringing it to me. I promise you, I've got you. Just keep bringing it to me. And so today we're going to end our time together with a little prayer. And if you would, if you're willing, just kind of open your hands up. And I want you to picture that thing that you were thinking was your vulnerability. That thing which you are placing on equal footing with Christ. And if you'll just, if you're comfortable, close your eyes so you can really visualize that thing, that competing attachment, that thing that gets our time and our attention. So Father, we come before you with our stuff. We're heavy. We're weighed down. We have these struggles that we are holding on to, God, because we think they give us something that you don't. We've convinced ourselves, God, that they give us a life that's better than the one you could give us, that they add something that you can't. And, Lord, we're wrong. And so we lift these things up to you. Lord, we ask you to take them from us. Change our hearts so that we, we put you back on the throne of our lives. Forgive us, God, for making idols out of the blessings you've given us, the blessings of jobs and careers and children and friendships. Forgive us, God, for anything we've put in your place and help us be strong enough, God, to choose your will when decisions and choices come up, help us to ask ourselves if it'll draw us closer to you, and if it won't, help us to say no, God. We love you so much, so wash us clean. Lord, help us believe that when you look at us, you do not see our sin. Help us really know, like deep down know, that you look at us and see the blood of your son. So Lord, we are a people that as we ask for your forgiveness, we are forgiven. We're going to walk out of this place fully forgiven, sinless, until we open our mouths and probably start the cycle all over again. And so, God, we recognize that's our state, and we recognize you are greater than it. Give us the strength. Give us your peace, and help us come on our knees daily to you. 
the life and the love you give is beyond comprehension. In your precious name we say, amen. Let's give it up.